there is a connection between a society pulling together around a purpose, especially a grand purpose that, that everyone cares about, such as World War II, the effort there. Um, that, that was a time of great national unity and purpose. And we don't have great rates in terms of the documents, but there's every likelihood that that was a low point in terms of the suicide rate in the United States. We know that that was true on 9-11, for instance, another, another day of great national unity and purpose. Everybody pulled together on that day. Uh, that day had saw the lowest suicide rates ever of any day in recorded U.S. history, and it's because everybody pulled together. And so that's what I think is the biggest resiliency factor is, is, is when people care about something, they care about the same thing, it creates unity among the people, they pull together uh, around a common purpose and goal. That, 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 that definitely suppresses suicide rates. Yeah, I mean, I, we are animals. We're biological creatures, just like ants and bees and, and wasps. And, and, and like those particular species, our social structure um, is very, it's, the term is eusocial. And the characteristics of eusocial species have to do with caring about one another. When a society is functioning well, you're a part of it, you have a purpose, and you feel like you belong. Those, those are clear protective factors, resiliency factors, if you will, against suicide. You know, different countries and different cultures have different definitions of happiness, and, and even among scientists, there isn't a fully agreed upon consensus definition of happiness. But that said, we're getting closer to understanding what we think happiness means. A lot of the existing measurements of happiness around the world really assume that people understand what happiness means already. They don't say, hey, happiness means this. And if I had to say that, I would say happiness means having a pretty easy time feeling positive emotions, um, being fairly capable of recovering from negative emotions quickly and gracefully, not holding on to negative emotional experiences for a long time, having a sense of meaning and purpose in life, and feeling connected to a community. That would be my way of sort of framing happiness. But again, we don't provide that definition. We simply say, how happy are you? But I've, you know, one notices that uh, you know, countries that have very few resources, they can still derive happiness. And so a family living in what is perceived to be uh, relatively profound poverty, that family can have times when they're very happy. Why, why are they happy? They gather together, they're a family, uh, they sing and dance, they play games, uh, they engage in their um, uh, society-based ceremonies. Can we be happy all the time? Absolutely not. What we've learned in, is that in our brain, we've got a pleasure circuitry. It's very well defined right now. It actually can be monitored, measured. The neurotransmitters, the chemical messengers are documented as to what makes us click. When those aren't working, and that is one of the key features of those with depressions, it's pretty hard to turn on that happiness cycle. But you gotta keep trying. It really is important to keep using it, to work on it, to have friends pick up on it, to seek out the circumstances that make one laugh, to hunt for the actual times when you know you've been happy in the past and try and use them again. We all have relationship problems, so a lot of them talk about relationship problems, and, and we're, we can relate to them when they're talking about some of the most painful things. Nobody goes into comedy because they were cool in high school. Uh, comedy comes from either a bad childhood or a lonely childhood. Just in your head all the time. Humor's a great way to deal with the problems in your life. And then I go out on stage and it's like therapy. I'm like, well, here's what's bothering me. Give a nice warm welcome to Mr. Darren Rose. From a psychological standpoint, even from a physical standpoint, when you laugh, you re release endorphins. Endorphins are a natural painkiller. Um, the more you laugh, the better you feel. One of the sad realities of getting older is you realize you're becoming your parents, right? It just sneaks up on you. All of a sudden, you're like, oh no. You know, you just find yourself doing something like, uh, you know, you're just, you know, sucking the joy out of a child's accomplishment by criticizing its performance. It, it, it takes us, you know, to another place, I think, and it gets us away from our everyday um, stress, our everyday jobs. I mean, we have, sometimes it gets us through 
you know, tragedies, comedy and humor. Uh, my mom's lovely. I didn't, I didn't grow up with my mom, though. I was, uh, I was raised by my dad. My dad raised my brother and I, because uh, uh, my parents got divorced when I was six months old. Uh, so that was my fault, not a big deal, but... <laughs> it's kind of a fun job to bring a little uh, laughter into the world. Comedians do what they do because there's an immediate sense of feedback and satisfaction and gratification of hearing people laugh. And when they hear that, there's something that feels really good about that. You get amped up. It's fun to laugh. I don't know, it brings people together. One has to acknowledge that not every moment is a happy moment. And so we're all faced with challenges. We're all faced with demoralization uh, in the sense of, you know, in order to succeed, you really truly have to double your failure rate. So success inadvertently comes with a high frequency of failure.